No doubt you remember this experiment. It shows how to demonstrate electromagnetic induction. And the idea is that you move this permanent magnet near this coil and uh, the electricity will flow one way when you send the magnet towards the coil and the other way when you pull the magnet away from the coil. Um, the upshot of that is that when you push the magnet in the galvanometer will deflect in one direction with the magnet still in any location the ga galvanometer goes back to zero when you pull the magnet away again we should find that we get the galvanometer deflecting in the opposite direction so the galvanometer stays still when the magnet is still when the magnet is pushed in the galvanometer deflects one way when the magnet is pulled out the galvanometer deflects the other way. But at any point again when the magnet stops moving, even if it's right in the middle here, inside the coil, um, we should find that the galvanometer goes back to the middle. So the electricity is only being produced in this coil when there's motion in the magnet. And we say that the magnetic flux, the magnetic field through the coil is changing and it's that change that causes this galvanometer to be moving either one way or the other. So we don't get any movement of the galvanometer, we don't get any electricity being produced for a magnet that's still. And that's important because it, it goes c correctly with our ideas about conservation of energy. So this is one of the things that Faraday demonstrated and we call it electromagnetic induction. Now the transformer works on a very similar principle to the previous experiment. Remember what we had was a magnet that was moving in and out of a coil and that was causing the motion of the galvanometer. So rather than a permanent magnet, what if we replace that magnetic field with one that was being produced from electricity? So we build ourselves a little circuit like this. And when we close the switch, we're going to have a magnetic fields suddenly appear. And that's going to be like rushing in a north pole towards coil S. So closing this switch causes magnetism to suddenly appear in this region outside coil P. And that is picked up by coil S. And this then produces current in one direction on the galvanometer. But then the magnetism steadies and the, the field through coil S, the flux through coil S, sorry, stops changing. And when it stops changing, then the galvanometer goes back to zero. Even though the current in the first circuit, the coil P, is still on and the magnetism is still there, it's not changing anymore. So coil S only picks something up and creates electricity when there's a change. So once the change ceases, the galvanometer goes back to zero. So we've currently got a steady field between the two coils, but no current because it's not changing. And if we then open the switch, that will cause the um, magnetism in the zone between the two. In this zone, the magnetism will just vanish. And that's the equivalent in the previous example of pulling the magnet away very rapidly in this direction. So turning the electricity off will cause the magnetic field to collapse. And as a consequence, we'll get a deflection in the negative direction on the galvanometer. Then once the magnetic field has disappeared and there is no change being detected anymore in coil S, the galvanometer will return to zero. So remember the galvanometer will only deflect when S is picking up a change in the flux through it, not steady flux. So now we feed coil P with an AC source of electricity. And the idea here is that this AC source will cause current one way, then the other, 
and the current will keep reversing. Now that will have the effect of making the second coil think that we're moving a magnet in and out of this zone. And what will happen is if we feed coil P with AC, we'll get a reversing magnetic field opposite coil S, and that will be picked up as a constant reversing change in the flux through it, which will produce a constant AC electricity in coil S. Okay, remember coil S reacts to change, an AC input produces an AC, an alternating um, magnetic field, and that will produce a constant uh, change in coil S. You'll have it always changing, going positive, going negative. So Faraday then looked at the EMF that would be produced if we weren't allowing a current to flow and we were just measuring the voltage being produced at the end of coil S when when we took a magnet and changed the magnetic flux going into coil S. And so Faraday told us that the EMF produced would be the delta of N phi where delta just represents the change and the, the change in N phi is the change in what we call the flux linkage. Now the linkage relates to the magnetic field that's coming through and the area of the coil and the number of turns n. So obviously depending on how many turns you have you get more flux linkage and if the magnetic field is stronger since phi equals BA then you would also get a bigger EMF. Now the other factor that affects this is how long it takes for this change to occur and that's going to be related to how quickly you're moving this magnet around. Or indeed if it's a coil, how rapidly the magnetic field is changing in this zone opposite coil S. So the flux phi, which is measured in Weber's, is equal to B times A, where B is the field strength and A is the area it's running through. So for your typical coil, the area we'll be talking about will be the area of the coil itself when the field is running through it at 90 degrees. So for field running at 90 degrees through the plane of the coil, it's just B times A. As the coil tilts, then the area it presents to the field will change. And in that case, you might need to think about the angle between the plane of the coil and the magnetic field coming through. So you could use B A sine theta, since uh, when it hits the coil plane at 90 degrees, sine theta then goes to 1, and when the angle between them is 0, sine theta goes to 0. So you get no flux through a coil that is parallel to the magnetic field coming through, and maximum flux when the coil is in this position where it's at 90 degrees to the field coming through. So this tends to come into play in situations where you're rotating a coil in the presence of a magnetic field. But the same principles apply if you're allowing a magnetic field to um, increase and decrease in the zone opposite a fixed coil. And that happens both in electromagnetic induction where you're, for example, uh, rotating a magnet, um, or in the transformer where a first coil is producing a magnetic field which is being picked up by a second coil. So all of these principles apply to both electromagnetic induction and transformers. And in the second video we'll look at some questions and hopefully solidify what we know about these things. Thanks for watching.